sports grid. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pedro. Uh, I, I am an engineering manager at Pinterest, and I lead the inclusive AI team there. And today I have with me one of my co-authors, and we're going to be presenting a paper we published um, at FACT last year about a practical end-to-end -end diversification search in recommender systems. So for today's talk, this is the, the outline that I have, the agenda I have for us to go through. Um, before, uh, so like on the introduction part here, one of the things I wanna make sure we can touch on is a little bit on the motivation for this work. Um, so a few years ago, back in 2018, we received a feedback um, from a painter. And a pinner is how we call our users at Pinterest, just, to, just so you all know. Uh, so let me read this. Like every other 17-year-old girl, I use social media and I am heavily influenced by it. I want to feel relevant. I want to feel beautiful. I want to feel up to speed on the new beauty standards. Lately, if I want to see people of color, I have to physically type the word black. If I ever want to feel like I am a beautiful contribution, I cannot look at your app because when I look at it, I am told people that look like me are not the norm. Now, this is this is extremely sad. I'm just going to acknowledge that this is really, it's really uh, a really bad experience, right? And this isn't acceptable in any any type of online experience um, that anyone wants to build today. But it's even more unaccept unacceptable at Pinterest because our mission as a company is literally to bring everyone the inspiration to create a life they love. So to truly be a place where everyone can find the most inspiring and relevant content for them, we're committed to content diversity and developing inclusive experience on the platform. And this is the whole ethos of, of the inclusive AI team at Pinterest. And it's the, soul, uh, uh, that's the main reason why we even exist at the company. So, um, with that, we ended up identifying the need of doing diversification at different stages of our pipeline. So let's just walk through a little bit of that. Um, so at Pinterest, we have, of course, we are heavily a recommendation a platform recommending content. And we do have a lot of different services in the platform. Like we have uh, home feed, which is what you see as soon as you open Pinterest. You have search, which is if you type something in search, you're going to have a feed. You have related feeds, which means you tapped on a pin. We call it a close up. You close up on a pin, then you see other pins that are um, related to that first one being shown. Uh, but at the end of the day, they all kind of look like this, right? So you have an item corpus with billions of items. Uh, in the case of Pinterest, we have like over 300 billion uh, pins, for example. Um, when you receive a query, and tech query, again, can be a text query, can be maybe if you tapped on a pin, that's the close-up pin plus the user. Um, that goes into candidate retrieval, right? Meaning like, okay, I have 200 billion pins. I probably cannot rank all of them. Give me maybe the top 5,000 that are most relevant, right? And on the CG side, candidate generation side, you have many, many different ways of doing candidate generation, right? You can do embedding-based. You can do... Um, interaction-based CGs, you can do um, things that the user liked recently and things like that. Like that. So there's many different ways of doing that. Uh, after that, we usually take into the ranking portion, right? And the ranking portion here, it's again, one or more different machine learning models. It tends to be uh, sometimes like a multi-head model or a combination of models. Um, and the whole idea here ultimately is just like, okay, I have 5,000 items. Again, probably not gonna show all of this to the user just rank them by whatever is the most relevant at this specific moment in time. And then ultimately you show that feed, the user is gonna interact maybe with 10 to 100 uh, of those first items, right? So when we were doing this work, um, because of the urgency and the need, one of the things we wanted to, to make sure we could do is, what can we do to have immediate impact, right? What can we do to mitigate the situation right now so we can create, we can improve that experience right now um, and then also thinking about what, what can we do better as we go forward, right? So the first thing we did was intervening at the ranking layer, more specifically at the post ranking stage. Uh, as soon as you do tap, right, because you were like right at the end of that funnel, you have, you're going to have immediate impact. Um, 
But we did identify that, of course, whatever you do at ranking is limited by whatever you get from retrieval. So we actually had to go back to the retrieval side as well and do a few more things. So, uh, and this, those two pieces here are what we're gonna be sharing today. Now, as soon as you're talking about diversification in recommendations, there is like a lot of things that you need to to kind of understand and we need to need to be talked about, right? I think the, the like the first one, of course, is what is the diversification dimension that of interest here, right? Is it demographics? Is it geographic? Is it cultural attributes? Like for example, in the case of Pinterest, um, users have a, a broad set of interests, right? Sometimes I come to Pinterest and I'm looking for what am I gonna cook tomorrow night for dinner? And then also like what I'm gonna dress for my next talk at the first. So like there's like a, a broad set of interests and we need to understand, okay, if a user is coming at a certain time, what is more interesting to them? Maybe it's a mix of those and you and I wanna diversify with respect to those, right? So those are some like domain specific dimensions, for example, in terms of diversification. Maybe it's actually a business specific type of metrics, right? Uh, I note that a lot of uh, big retailers like Amazon, for example, if they're showing products, sometimes they want to diversify with respect to merchants, right? And then again, how do you segment merchants? Is it by, by merchant size? Is it by catalog? There's a lot of different ways to do that. And there's like implicit dimensions, right? And this is, we're talking about you going to the um, like embedding space, for example, you can identify different clusters that have uh, certain attributes and you want to diversify amongst those clusters. Uh, so that's the first thing you need to determine. Uh, for our specific use case here, we're going to be talking about skin tone. Uh, so that's going to be our, our dimension of interest. Um, and then the second question that we, we ask is, do you need to have an interference in multiple stages, right? Do you need to do multi-stage diversification? Um, again, like I said before, whatever you do at ranking, you're going to probably see immediate impact. But if your retrieval is actually really biased, it's going to have very little impact, right? So you so more more often than not to actually have to go upstream and do work on both of those stages. Uh, also, what is the triggering logic for your diversification? Um, basically, like when does it make sense to diversify, right? Um, it is not always like oh, let's just diversify every single time. Sometimes uh, you want to focus on specific queries, specific interests, for example. So, for example, if we're talking about skin tone. Um, we usually care a lot about types of queries that have to surface a lot of humans, right? For example, if I'm looking for makeup, then skin tone is really important, like makeup, fashion, these kind of things. If I'm looking for home decor, if I'm looking for food, it doesn't it doesn't really matter that much. So if you introduce that logic on that space, you might just be making the experience worse, which is of course never the, the intention here. And then uh, one one of the things we often get asked is, you know, how does diversification plays with personalization? And and it's it's interesting because a lot of people think it's kind of a zero sum game. You can have either or. And honestly, what we see is that, uh, at least for our use cases, that's not the case. Um, again, at Pinterest, people come and they are at different stages of, of exploration, right? We are very much a um, platform that people come for inspiration. So oftentimes people have a very broad idea and they're like, you know, maybe I'm looking for fall fashion inspiration. And when they are at that very high level stage, they actually want to see more diversification. And we validated that through actually A-B experiments and user research. So it actually works in favor, like doing that actually uh, brings us a lot more engagement and user satisfaction on the platform. And then when they go down to that funnel of, of exploration and they, they kind of like more sure what they wanted, that's when personalization kicks in, right? But even thinking about what this personalization means here, more often than not, we're talking about personalization with respect to your style, right? Like, oh, I'm someone that like very minimalistic kind of decor, or I like like really goth kind of clothing, these kind of things. And not necessarily um, uh, your dimension that you're trying to diversify about. So that's, that's something to keep in mind on when you do this. And then lastly, how are you even going to measure that if you're uh, being successful, right? Uh, what is your diversity metric? Uh, there's many, many ways to do this and to measure this. I'm just going to acknowledge that. So I'm not going to say there's a right or wrong. For our specific use case here, uh, we chose to do diversity at K for a given ring R. And this is basically looking at like, you know, if you're given a set of queries, 
uh, we're trying to define the top K diversity of a system as the fraction of queries where all groups under our diversity dimension were represented in the top K ranked results, right? And this helps us understand, okay, if we have all of the skin tones represented in the top 20 or top 30, again, this is depending on your specific application, we consider that to be a success, right? And then we're looking at the fraction, meaning like, okay, out of all the feeds we're serving where we're doing diversification, what is the percentage of those where we are being successful having all of those? And, and this helps us understand what is the baseline and then when you do these interventions, um, how, how is that metric moving? But again, you can use like normalized entropy, you can use a uh, channel actability as well. There's like a lot of different ways of, of doing this. Okay, so I'm gonna get a little bit into that first uh, that first intervention, we did it into the latest stage, which is the ranking stage, right? Um, so the first thing we did here uh, is we used uh, round robin. Round robin, it is a very simple algorithm. It's very fast, um, and you're gonna you're gonna have immediate impact, right? And this is one of the things you want to try it really early on. Is like, what can we do quickly that's gonna actually give us the the maximum um, in terms of diversification. Um, and this is just an example of how it works. You can see the top part here of, of this list. And we just put some colors here uh, to represent different skin tones. Um, and this list is supposedly ordered by utility, right? By the utility scores you had out of your ranking layer. Um, and you're doing a round robin with respect to your um, dimension, right? So I'm literally picking like, okay, give me the highest uh, item ranked with a specific skin tone. And then you're just re-ranking that list. Right. Uh, again, very simple, very fast. So basically, you're going to have no impact on latency and any of those things. Um, now you can think about there's like, of course, uh, several different cons here, right? Because I think the main one is that uh, you, if you don't use any thresholding in terms of your scores, you may now be boosting items that were really all the way down on your utility ranked list, and maybe they were down there for a reason, right? So you need to be careful, like how how far do I want to boost? because ultimately you don't want to degrade that experience, right? Um, the second cone here, which did become kind of a big deal for us is, this is really hard to generalize to multiple dimensions, right? We're talking just about skin tone, but today at Pinterest, we actually do already diversification with, with respect to skin tone and body types. So as soon as we introduce another, um, another attribute for diversification, this starts becoming very complex and maybe it's not really scalable that well. And then the last one is it, it's really hard using this, this technique. It's really hard to balance between diversity and utility, right? Because you have, you, basically what you're doing here is if you visualize the scale, round robin setting like 100% on diversification, right? And that's all you're doing here. And utility, it, not that much. Utility is basically like you just, we're based off of the list, but maybe one of your items were ranked really low and now you boosted really high. So you lost a little bit of that of track of, of your utility here. So with those trade-offs, we actually decided to, to move on and use DPP. Uh, so DPP stands for Determinant Tone Point Process. And DPP is a machine learnable probabilistic model. Uh, it's, it's really commonly used and, and it came up in physics uh in the context of repulsion modeling now the way the dpp works is it can be parameterized by a positive semi-definite kernel matrix where the diagonal of that matrix represents the utility of the items right again usually that's going to be one or multiple machine learning models and usually you have a final score that's just combined right because if you're trying to just rank a list you're going to have certain a certain score that's going to be ranking that um, and then on the off diagonal of the matrix, you're actually going to have the similarity between the items. And you know, in our case here, we use similarity with respect to the dimension itself. So similarity with respect to skin tone. Uh, so when you solve the PP, what you're trying to do is actually just finding a subset A uh, that's going to maximize the determinant of the matrix. So what this ends up promoting is you ended up having items to have very high utility and you demote items that are very similar to each other, right? So you, now you're actually doing, you're doing tech computation where you are balancing out uh, the, the utility and um, the similarity of the items. So uh, 
I think one of the callouts we need to do is solving DPP is actually in P hard. Uh, but one of the interesting things about DPP is that it has a sub submodeler property. So the solution can actually be efficiently approximated using uh, a greedy algorithm. So what you're trying to do here is basically really select the next item such that the incremental determinant of the, of the matrix is maximized, right? So basically for running DPP, uh, you're going to have the following parameters. You have the kernel matrix itself. Um, and that, that kernel matrix here have like a K by K. But again, you DPP, you need to be clever how you use it just to optimize it just so you don't fall into the traps of being an NP hard problem, right? You compute a K by K matrix. Maybe you don't need to compute this for your final rank list. Again, maybe that was a thousand items. Maybe you just want to do for a batch of them. Maybe just the top 100, the top 200 or so. And that already reduces the size of that matrix and it's going to give you some gains in computation, right? Um, the other thing here you need to, uh, another interesting parameter is the reposure window size, uh, W. And W here is basically where the logic uh, tries to maintain diversity within that set. So it's almost like this. You're selecting the next item and then you look back and you look at your W, right? So when I'm going to select the next item, I'm going to look at my last four or five items to understand how diverse I have been before I select the next one. That's kind of an intuitive way to look at W. Um, so for each batch, uh, these are the steps, right? First, you initialize your set. And then each step, we greatly select the ith item. And then you add it to the existing set such that the determinant of the matrix is maximized. Um, and then you basically keep doing this until you reach the defined batch size. And even on this one, you can do some early stopping, right? Maybe you pick 200 as your batch, but you want to stop as soon as you hit position 100 and then just append the remaining items. And this can be determined using different factors. Maybe you can look, for example, um, what is the average depth that users looked uh, when they are browsing, right? Um, I, I usually like to say that in a lot of contexts, if you're browsing, you show recommendations, and your user has to look over 100 items to find something relevant, you probably failed as a recommendation system, right? Um, so this is something to keep in mind as well to, to make sure um, you optimize DPP to a certain extent. Um, the one other thing that I actually don't have shown here in this equation is that DPP has um, a parameter that's basically tuning. It's a weight that tunes between utility and, and the similarity like basically putting like how much weight you want it, right? So instead of round robin, which is forcing you 100% into diversification, that gives you a little bit of wiggle room to understand of um, how how much weight you want to put on diversification versus utility. Um, so just to finalize on this part, I wanted to show here a visualization of this too, right? So on the top here, I just have a ranked list ordered by utility scores. And then on the left, I have basically what we see with round robin. Like again, you're literally picking, give me the next one of my dimension. And you can even see here that it, it may create this visual effect of, uh, oh, I see a pattern here where you have this repeating thing. Again, you can do many things to solve this. Maybe you want to do um, aim batch like within the dimensional. So basically within the first four, you can just um, do a shuffle of those if you want to avoid visual patterns. But my whole point here is it is it is complicated because it just creates a lot of um, uh, a lot of movement on your utility list if you don't have other measures for it. Now on the right side, I have what we usually see with DPP, right? Um, so like I said here, you have a parameter that basically allows you to optimize it list wise, which is one of the the, the most important things with DPP, uh, and you have a really good balance between uh, utility and diversification. Now, again, if you look at the top four, I definitely do not have the same diversification that I had with round robbing, but we often want to look beyond that, right? Uh, like I said, I probably don't care too much at position 100, 200, because at that point, the user may have even dropped out of the experience, but we really care about the top 20 or so. You want to make sure you have enough representation within those while maintaining that high quality. So that was one of the main motivations for us using the PP. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it to Shuloka, who's going to be sharing a little bit about the next stage of this work, which is looking at diversification and retrieval. Hi, everyone. I'm Shuloka. I'm a machine learning engineer at Pinterest, and I work alongside Pedro and Inclusive AI. 
Let me just share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Okay, cool. Um, so in this section, like Pedro mentioned, I'll go over some of the approaches that we used for retrieval diversification. So our ability to diversify in the ranking stage is often limited by the availability of candidates at retrieval. All the techniques that we talked about in the previous section are limited to the set of candidates retrieved by the different candidate generators at the retrieval stage. Even if we assume a fair ranker, retrie retrieval work has an outsized impact on the final ranking and expands the impact of ranking interventions. Uh, so in order to improve the diversity at the retrieval stage, we successfully tried three different approaches. The first of which is overfetch and re-rank. Um, so with this approach, we aim to fetch a larger set of candidates, which can be defined as containing a minimum number of candidates from each skin tone range. So for example, if we want to retrieve a candidate set of size K through K nearest neighbor search in an embedding space, we could expand the neighborhood size to K prime such that K prime is greater than K and the re resultant candidate set has at least a certain number of candidates from each group. And since we can only pass K candidates to the ranking stage, we can then perform a round robin selection of a subset of size K from this overfed set um, and pass it to the ranking stage. Um, another thing to note here is that the expanded size of the neighborhood could lead to an increase in latency. And to prevent that, we can choose a hyperparameter k max such that k prime never exceeds k max, and um, so that the overfetching will stop when either the minimum threshold in each group is reached or when k prime equals k max. Another approach um, we can try is bucketize approximate nearest neighbor search. So for embedding-based retrieval, the users, items, and queries are all embedded in the same space. And for search and recommender systems, we want to retrieve items that are closest to the query or user embedding in terms of a chosen metric, such as cosine distance. Um, since computing pairwise distances for all query item pairs is prohibitive, we typically use approximation algorithms such as k-dimensional tree, locality-sensitive hashing, uh, or HNSW, which is hierarchical navigable small worlds. Um, so this figure shows the general architecture of an ANN sort system that contains a root node that sends a request to a few leaf nodes that further requests several segments to perform a nearest neighbor search in different subregions of the embedding space. Um, so let's say there are L number of leaves and M number of segments per leaf to find the K nearest neighbor for a given query embedding. Each segment will return K potential nearest neighbor candidates to the corresponding leaf which then aggregates these M times K candidates to only retain the top K candidates. And then this is passed along to the root and the root is responsible for choosing K candidates from the K times L candidates that it now has. And um, sorry, um, so for this, um, for the bucketize approximate near, uh, nearest neighbor search, um, we modify the aggregation step um, at the leaf node as well as the root level to also aggregate the top K candidates from each skin tone into a bucket. Um, so these buckets are passed to the root along with the top K candidates and can we can either return the buckets themselves or aggregate them using something like round robin. Um, and then in search, we tried strong or um, so in search, typically a text query is converted to a structured query or an S query, which allows retrieval systems to use logical operators. So for example, a text query may be parsed to dress and red or black. 
um, strong or acts as an or logical operator, but it prioritizes a candidate set that satisfies multiple criteria simultaneously. So like an or operator, we can specify that the retrieve set specify, uh, match one condition or another, but we can also specify what minimum percentage of candidates match each of the respective criteria. So as we scan the list from left to right, strong or initially will act as an or. So if it naturally satisfies the minimum condition, the, the original set is returned. Otherwise, it becomes a required criterion. So for example, um, in this figure, we have two terms, term one and term two, and we want to fetch five candidates. Um, in a regular OR, we would just fetch candidates one, two, three, four, five. Um, but with strong OR, we require at least three candidates match term one. So after we fetch candidates one, two, and three, instead of returning four and five, we will return six and nine. Um, and now I'll talk about some practical considerations we kept in mind while deploying these approaches in production. First is indexing. Um, so being able to diversify at retrieval means we need to have the diversity dimension of the pins, which is the skin tone available in both our embedding based as well as token based indices. Um, so for each pin, the skin tone range is calculated offline using a computer vision model. And then we use uh, offline batch workflow to, um, to add it to the indexing pipelines for each surface. Um, the indexed diversity dimension can then be passed along with the retrieved candidates to the ranking stage for ranking diversification, or we can retrieve it separately from stores or a caching service. Second is uh, an impact um, on latency and scaling. Um, so for round robin, it has a minimum impact on latency because it's linear time complexity but it's hard to scale when we're using multiple dimensions. So for example, if we want to diversify for skin tone as well as the category of the pin, like home decor, fashion, et cetera, um, the number of possible combinations may become impractical. Um, and so a possible solution in that case is to use a priority queue to iterate over these multiple dimensions. Um, for DPP, the similarity matrix is computed at serving time for the entire list of pins in the ranking. And um, while we need to compute the diversity term at each step, the utility scores can be cached. Um, and we can further reduce impact to latency through other techniques, um, which we optimized and evaluated through offline replay. Um, so one thing that Pedro mentioned is that you can tune the bat size. Um, instead of re-ranking the entire list, you can only diversify up to a certain position B. You can also tune the depth to which uh, we seek diverse pins, and both of these help with latency. And third, um, we collected qualitative feedback from a diverse set of internal participants for every iteration. Uh, we presented them with a side-by-side -side comparison of results before and after diversification and ask them to rate the results based on diversity and relevance. Um, and we also collected relevance evaluations through professional data labeling for all our AB experiments. And we collaborated closely with the internationalization team for a qualitative assessment of diversification um, in various markets to account for local context. And in this section, I'll talk about the results of deploying these approaches. Um, we deployed skin tone diversification for three surfaces on Pinterest, search, where a user can enter a text query and see pins relevant to their intent, related products, where a user can see a list of product pins similar to the pin selected by them. Um, and lastly, new user home feed, um, which is the initial home feed that users see when they first sign up on Pinterest. All these results are from AB experiments that were run for at least three weeks in US and international markets. 
um, we measured the impact to diversity at K and user engagement metrics. Um, so this table shows um, impact to skin tone diversity at K for each of the three surfaces using different diversification approaches. A single asterisk indicates positive impact engagement and a double asterisk indicates neutral engagement. For all three surfaces, we started with round robin for ranking diversification, which we followed by DPP. Um, one thing to note is when we moved from round robin to DPP for related products, we observed a small decrease in skin tone diversity, but a positive impact to engagement. And the reason for that is that DPP tries to balance utility as well as diversity, whereas round robin only um, reorders pins based on the diversity dimension. And so it kind of forms an upper bound on the skin tone diversity we can achieve. And so with uh, when we move from round robin to DPP, we see a slight decrease in skin tone diversity, but we see engagement metrics go up. And in this case, we saw clicks, long clicks and saves increase by more than 5%. Um, and then for on the retrieval side, um, the approach we used varied per surface. For search, we used strong R for related products, bucketized in and retrieval, and overfetch and re-rank for new user home feed. And the last call out I want to make here is that we observed gains in diversity metrics with neutral to positive impact on utility metrics, such as engagement. And this would suggest that the systems were not operating at the Pareto frontier between diversity and utility. Um, since we could increase diversity without negatively impacting utility, and sometimes we even managed to increase both. So this is an example of diversification in related products. On the left is a query pin. On the right, we see results before and after diversification. Here is another example on search. This shows results for the query pink nails mat before diversification and with round robin and DPP diversification. And then some ethical considerations we kept in mind while doing this work. First is while we use skin tone ranges to surface diverse results, user engagement with these ranges are not used as input to train our ML ranking models. And it's also important to note that skin tone ranges are pin features, not user features. We respect the user's privacy and do not predict the, the user's personal information, such as their ethnicity. To conclude, uh, we deployed multi-stage diversification at ranking and retrieval on several Pinterest services and showed that it's possible to create an inclusive product experience that positively impacts business metrics, such as engagement. Our techniques are scalable for multiple diversity dimensions and can support intersectionality. Um, some future work includes, um, the first one of these we've already deployed um, is advanced and scalable triggering mechanisms for diversification, uh, which don't rely on heuristics. Um, another, um, another piece of work for the future is automatically adapting weights for multi-objective optimization over time in an automated manner. Um, and then we can also take inspiration from research and debiasing item embeddings and fair representation learning to ensure that our underlying representations um, are fair for relevant diversity dimensions. And lastly, um, we can analyze impact to serving bias um, uh, because with more diversified search results and recommendations, we can help mitigate some of that bias in systems that generate their own training data. Um, especially now that we're creating a positive feedback loop for model retraining, thanks to the content we are now surfacing. Um, and while we love to see positive impact metrics, one of the most satisfying things is actually seeing how this is impacting users. 
Here is some feedback from pinners for features we have launched over the years, um, which include skin tone, hair pattern, body type filters, as well as diversification by default. I'll read out one of my favorite ones, um, which is the one in the middle. Um, the thing that really has me is how ordinary searches show more diversity and default results. It's so incredibly powerful. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, I'll leave the rest up here for you to read, but thank you. And I would like to thank all our collaborators at Pinterest without whom this work would not have been possible. Yeah, we can 